chapter number two, where we left off with our thoughts last week. On having the Christ like mind. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We saw last week that we need to be able to empty ourselves of self and push self out so that we might be filled with the Holy Spirit of God in our life. The illustration of the gas tank, the gas tank is always full. It's either always full of air or it's always full of fuel. And unfortunately, cars don't run on air. If that could happen, someone will make a fortune. Um, but when we fill up our gas tank with gas and with fuel, it forces the air out of the gas tank so that it is filled with fuel. And as we drive, as the gas goes down, as the, meter, as, as the little needle goes down, air fills back in. We must be constantly in our life pushing out self so that we may be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And we quoted the famous football coach, Bob Zupke, last week. He asked the question, what makes a man fight? And he answered his own question by saying, Two forces are at war in every fighter, the ego and the goal. An overdose of self-love, coddling of the ego, makes bums of men who ought to be men who, men who ought to be champions. Forgetfulness of self, complete absorption in the goal, makes champions out of bums. And we have to remember as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is our goal to become like Christ. That is our goal. And we must absorb ourselves in that goal, in reaching that goal, in doing, in doing what we need to do in our life to become more like Christ every day. And the Apostle Paul was also absorbed with this goal in, in Philippians chapter 3 and in verse number 10. This shows us how absorbed the Apostle Paul was in this goal of being like Christ. Philippians 3 and verse number 10. The Bible tells us there that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. We see, and we have seen here a mind, Christ, has a, Christ had a mind of selflessness. And now we see that Christ had a mind of service. Our great example of Christian service, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a great servant. In verse, in verse 7 there, where we read in, in Philippians chapter 2, it says there, But he made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 
2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9. <coughs> For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich. Jesus Christ, as God, left his heavenly throne, wrapped himself in human flesh, and came to this sin-cursed earth. And he did it to serve. Jesus said himself of, to his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 28. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20 and verse 28, the Bible tells us there, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ didn't come to this earth just to sit on a throne and let other people serve him. He came to serve others. That was his call. And part of that call, to serve others, to seek and to save, that which was lost, to be a servant that would give his life for us at the cross of Calvary. Dr. Getz shares, as I was growing up, there were many things I thought about doing. Once as a teenager, I wanted to be a barber. But back in the 60s, when no one was... No one was getting their hair cut. I decided that was a dumb idea. Did you know, did you know, the great, did you know that the greatest goal would be, the greatest goal that we could have for our lives is to be a servant? That should be the greatest goal of every life, especially every believer's life. We're to have the mind of Christ and his was to serve. He says, I tell our college students often that when they graduate, they ought to go out and find the lowest rung on the ladder. In a world where everyone is climbing the ladder of success, there won't be much competition from the bottom rung. Grab the place of lowly service and hang on because one day God is going to turn the ladder around. And that he certainly will do. The Bible says in Luke 14 and verse 11, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Christ is not only a great servant, but he performed great service. Albert Einstein declared, it is high time that the ideal of success should be replaced by the ideal of service. Too many people spell service as serve us. Even in churches. There are, there are people who will go to a church and they will become part of that church. They will join that church for what that church can do for them. But wasn't it John F. Kennedy who said, ask not what, you, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country? As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be able to ask the question, not what can the church do for us, but what can I do for my church? What can I do for my Savior? Not what my Savior has done for me. 
What can I do for him? Someone has said that the best exercise for our hearts is to bed down several times a day to help someone else. But you might be here tonight and you might say, I don't have any talent or ability. Did you know that God's not looking for ability? God has on-the-job training. He'll train you in what, you want, what he wants you to do. He'll equip you for what he wants you to do. What God is looking for is availability. He's looking for pliability, like the clay, to be molded and shaped. And he's looking for dependability. Those that won't be offended and quit the first moment something goes wrong. Oh, I got a hangnail in the service of the Lord. That's it. And unfortunately, there are many like that today in the service of the Lord, especially here in the United States. See, the porch light can do something the sun cannot. The porch light can shine at night. God didn't save us to sit, soak, and sour. He saved us to stand, strive, and serve. And by the way, that's where the joy of the Christian life is found in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The hymn writer wrote, there is joy in serving Jesus as I journey on my way. And that is true. And that's exactly what Jesus taught to his disciples. In the Gospel of John, chapter 18, and verse number 17, John chapter 18, oh, did I write that down wrong? No, 13, I'm sorry, I read it wrong. John chapter 13 and verse 17, there we go, now I'm cooking. John chapter 13 and verse number 17. Even the spirit of truth which the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. And I may have written that down wrong. See, Jesus doesn't promise joy to those who simply know the Bible. He promises joy to those who do what they know from the word of God. You can memorize all 31 verses in the Bible, but that won't make you happy. There won't be any joy in it. Karl Marx, the founder of communism, had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John memorized as a teenager and could recite them perfectly in public. But he died an atheist. Should be able to have and think of ways to practice selflessness and service as we go through our days.
Dr. Getz shares this story from his life. He says, be careful because if you tell God you're willing to serve him, he will more than likely give you a chance to prove it. In our ministry, our pastor has taught us to greet people and say, is there anything I can do for you? It's a dangerous question, you understand, but one that should be asked. It sounds great, it's quite impressive, but becomes very routine. We say it to the UPS man who delivers packages, to first-time visitors in church, to prospective students, to anyone who dares to step foot on our campus. We don't, we don't really mean it, we just say it. A few years back, an elderly lady in our church had become ill and was hospitalized, and Reports were coming back that she may not live, she may not have long to live. I had met this a couple years ago in a revival meeting in California. The man had a great solo voice and used to sing in revival meetings where I would preach. They were a delightful couple, and I was thrilled to catch up with them when I started preaching revival meetings at Lancaster Baptist Church in 1986. When I assumed my position with the college, I was excited to see them more often and enjoyed their friendship and fellowship. Now she, now she was perhaps on her deathbed, and I knew that I needed to go up and see them. But good intentions got eaten up by my to-do list, and I kept putting it off. I knew that I would deeply regret not going up and having prayer with them if she should slip into eternity. One day as I finished my last class, a Around 1 p.m., I decided to do everything else, decided that everything else was going to have to wait. I jumped in my car and headed for the hospital. Coming back to my office, I informed my secretary that I would be back on campus in an hour. I was headed to the hospital. Upon entering the room, I went over to the bedside and offered some words of encouragement, read some scripture, and prayed. This wonderful servant of Christ for many years smiled, thanked me, and drifted back to sleep. I sat down with her husband, and we talked for about 40 minutes on various things, including the funeral that he wanted for his dear wife. I glanced at my watch. It was 10 minutes unto 2, and I said, I need to be getting back to the office. Let me have a word of prayer with you. We bowed our heads and prayed, and when I was finished, I stood up and said, I've got to be going. It was great to visit with you. I'll be praying for you. Is there anything I can do for you? He stood up and said, yes, there is. I was stunned. No one had ever responded this way before. Pastor Chapel had taught us, as far as I could remember, what to say next. So I said, what is it? He exclaimed, I want a pair of shoes just like Pastor Chapel's. I said, you do? He said, yep. And I know you can get them for me. I said, you mean the loafers? with the little tassels on top. Those are the ones, he said. What color? I asked. He said, black. And what size? He said, seven, which is small for a man's foot, you understand. Uh, heading for the door, I called back. I'll be back in an hour. Had a smile on my face and a spring in my step until I got to the hallway. Suddenly, the smile in the spring was gone. My pace quick, quickened to a frantic jog, and I was headed for the stairs and out to my car. A pair of shoes? Lord, what's this all about? I don't have time to buy a pair of shoes. Do I look like a shopper? I scanned my brain for the nearest store that might have a pair of shoes. There was a Marshall store about a mile away. I raced to the store, praying that God would let me find them quickly. Marshalls didn't have them. I headed to Mervyn's a few blocks further down the street. No luck. I was leaning. I was, I was learning now that size 7 was a very small size for a man's shoe. Both of, the, both of these stores had informed me that they would not carry any men's shoes in a size 7, much less the kind I was looking for. I thought, I'm going to have to go to the mall. I hate the mall. Making my way down the freeway, I pulled into the parking lot and ran into the first normal store, J.C. Penney's. <laughs> then to Sears, then to a place called Gottschalk, and I was working my way up. And finally, there was only one store left, Dillard's. Second cousin to Macy's, I never shopped there except during the January sale. They had them just like Pastor Chapel in black and size 7. I picked them up, and I turned them over to see the price. 
$129.95. I didn't have that kind of cash on me, but I did possess a credit card, so I bought the shoes. About an hour later, I had left. I walked back into the hospital room with a box of shoes. I said, there you go, just like Pastor Chapels. He said, thank you. I said, you're welcome, and walked out. You know, I've never seen that man wear those shoes. Oh, I look every time I see him as I shake his hand. I am pulling up his trousers with the other hand. To this day, I have no idea why he wanted those shoes. But I know why God had me go and get them. God taught me a lesson that day about serving. It's one, it's one thing to sing songs about serving and talk to talk. It's quite another to walk to walk. And we'll leave with that and my time is done and we'll continue with these thoughts and hopefully finish up these thoughts next week. I appreciate your time and attention. And do your best to find a way to serve someone the next couple of days and throughout next week.